Good morning and welcome to our first Sunday after Easter. I want to lead you in with these words adapted from 1 John verses 1 and 2. When we walk in the light of Christ, we have fellowship with one another. When we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. For in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has showered mercy upon the entire world. Amen. Join us, please, for worship this morning. As we come this Sunday again, I offer the peace of Christ to you. And so we serve a risen Lord. Please send that message out to those that you know. We serve a risen Lord. And the response will be, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Pass those words along in greeting. Our call to worship this morning is responsive. We have been freed. Fear and death have no claim on us. Christ the Lord is risen. Even though we have not touched his wounded hands, yet we believe. Even though we have not heard him speak our names, yet we believe. Let us celebrate God's love through the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in prayer this morning as we lead into worship. Lord of resurrection surprises, open our hearts to stay to the presence of Jesus Christ. Erase our excuses for unbelief and exchange them for strong witness to the power of your mercy and love. Give us courage and challenge us, Lord, to walk the path of discipleship, knowing that Jesus goes before us, leading and guiding our steps. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, the scripture reading for today is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If, they, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. 
though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that my, by believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Thank you, Mary Alice, for reading the scripture this morning. My sermon is entitled, Different Kinds of Faith. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, writes this first encounter with Jesus, the one where Thomas was absent. And he writes that it took place on Easter evening. This is the same day the disciples saw the empty tomb, the same day that Mary saw Jesus in the garden, the same day when the three women went to the tomb to cover the body of Jesus with the spices, but found instead the stone rolled away, the body gone, and an angel in his place. And this story also lines up with Luke's account, where Jesus encountered the two men on the Emmaus Road. Once those disciples broke bread with Jesus and they recognized him, they rose up immediately and returned to Jerusalem. As they were in the room gathered with the ten, they told them what had happened. And then Jesus suddenly stood in the room among them and said to them, Peace be with you. But this is no ordinary room. It is locked for fear of the Jews who might come after the remaining disciples. They are hidden, shaking, terrified of any noise or disruption they may hear, for their ears are tuned painfully to outside the door. And this room is unordinary too in that it cannot keep out the power of the risen Lord who is contained neither by a rock nor a locked door. It's a bit surprising, isn't it, that the disciples are afraid because Peter and the other disciple, John, had entered the empty tomb and the other disciple, John, saw and believed immediately. Yet, what did he believe? Did he really understand the scripture at that point that Jesus must rise from the dead? Perhaps their fear was more based on the trauma of the crucifixion and the concern of what might happen next. Perhaps the disciples would be hunted down and crucified as well by the Jewish authorities. For us, we may find their fear a disappointment. After all, they had had the special privilege of walking, talking, being taught, viewing miracle after miracle, and seeing firsthand the power Jesus had had every day for three years. They had firsthand knowledge, and they are acting like disciples whose leader is dead. Yet it is to these fearful, frightened disciples that Jesus passes on his peace, even as he had promised. And this peace Jesus offers will come to these disciples in spite of persecution by a world which will hate them even as it hates Jesus. The peace Jesus offers is the Jewish concept of shalom. It is more than the absence of conflict. It is a wholeness that is a gift of God. It is the blessed peace in the midst of turbulence. Shalom, more than just peace. The entrance of Jesus' appearance through the locked door is a mystery. For on one hand, Jesus enters through a visible locked door, suggesting his body is now a different quality. But then on the other hand, his wounds confirm his bodily resurrection and is clearly recognizable by the disciples. Luke adds, Jesus ate a meal with the disciples at this time. Jesus' resurrected body, therefore, is like ours and yet not like ours. Paul speaks of the resurrection body as imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. But let's not take the word spiritual too far, because Jesus' body was also very physical. John's point is that this person, Jesus, who stands before them alive and well, 
is the same person who was recently crucified. And at the sight of him, their weeping, their mourning, their fear was turned into joy as Jesus had earlier promised that it would be. And it was a joy that was so profound that they would forget their former pain. This visit of Jesus to the disciples is, if not the fulfillment, the beginning of the fulfillment of John's words in 1620, where he, Jesus had said, your sorrow will be turned to joy. So as a woman forgets the anguish of labor pains for the joy that a human being is born into the world, are the words the disciples remember that Jesus had said to them before the, the crucifixion. They had indeed wept and mourned when Jesus had been arrested and crucified. But now pain was turned into joy at seeing Jesus alive once again. Hallelujah. And here is the turning point for the remaining 11 that are in this room right now. For never again will they be fearful and unbelieving. What was what was your turning point? Can you remember it? I certainly can remember mine. I stood at the foot of a set of stairs that led up into a church I had never attended before. Never been inside. Fear was caught in my throat. What would it be like to enter? How would the people inside react to me as I came in? Was this the right thing to do? But as I took each slow upward step and entered the sanctuary of that church, I knew right then that it was good, that it was right, and that my Lord had met me. I was then the one to enter through the door, not a locked door, it was an open door, but I was as welcomed as a sight as Jesus was when he entered into the midst of the disciples through that locked door. For Jesus was waiting for me to return to him and come home. And if you're listening to this right now and you're hearing these words, Jesus is waiting for you too, to come home, to come back to him. The peace that I must have felt at that moment, the peace that I did feel at that moment, must have been the peace the disciples felt. And now Jesus gives the disciples his peace a second time and says, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. A few pages earlier in John's written account, he had written for us to read Jesus' prayer for his disciples. As you, Father, sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. You can read that in John 17, 18. So it's now explicit what Jesus had meant in that prayer. It's equivalent. It's it's John's equivalence of the Great Commission that we read in Matthew's Gospel account in 28, 19, and 20. The principal effect is that the one who is sent by authority is the same as the authority of the one who sent him. God is present in the work of Jesus, and Jesus will be present in the work of his disciples. And in this day and age, that is you and me. And Jesus is present amongst our work. It is the passing of the baton. Did you ever play that in high school or public school? You ran the race around the track and you had to pass the baton. You had to make sure that you caught it from the person behind you so that you could push it on to the person in front of you. That's what this is all about. It's passing the baton. It's the designation of succession. But there's a catch here. You see, to send the disciples into the world alone would be futile. We cannot go into the world without something that God gives us. 
And Jesus prepared his disciples for that. He breathes on them, or rather he breathes into them. Just as God breathed into man the breath of life in Genesis, Jesus breathes into the disciples the spirit of life. The disciples' lives were renewed as the spirit was breathed into them. It's just as those dead bones in Ezekiel, which were brought to life by God's breath, and they arose and lived. So the disciples who have been afraid and confused, hidden in a locked room to escape danger, now have the strength to stand up, to unlock the door, to go outside and begin their proclamation. All that is but Thomas. Thomas wasn't with them when Jesus came. We don't know where he was or why he was absent. All we know is that earlier he had thought that going to Bethany with, with Jesus would mean death for the disciples too. Remember, this was when Jesus was to go to the sleeping Lazarus and awake him from his tomb. Thomas does not believe the disciples when he gathers again with them after this event. But then neither did the disciples believe Mary when she came back with almost the same words that the disciples spoke to Thomas. She said, I have seen the Lord. They didn't believe. The disciples said, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas doesn't believe. Thomas is often thought of as the sole doubter, but he is not, and neither will he remain a doubter. He does doubt the witness of the other disciples and so cannot believe in the resurrection. But once he sees what they have seen, he will show great faith. Perhaps his absence has a message here for us today. We are absent from each other. Some of us keep in touch with others. The plain fact is that we need each other for the faith strengthening fellowship of each other. We need other Christians. We are not meant to be lone Christ followers. But let us not be too hard on Thomas or on each other. Thomas had once uttered the words, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas has been a zealous follower of Jesus, but he has also seen his worst fears realized. The crucifixion has broken his heart. Thomas believed, but his belief was betrayed. We can understand why he was slow to believe again. But a week later, behind closed and locked doors, Jesus appears again. This time, Thomas is with the others. And once again, Jesus offers his peace to them. Then, without condemnation, Jesus sees Thomas and tells him to do what we would be the turning point for Thomas, to touch and see the nail holes and the marks. And Jesus allows him to do that. There is no evidence that Thomas does actually touch those spots, seeing seems to be enough for him. In response, Thomas makes his great confession of faith. My Lord and my God. The gospel that John writes shows us that there are different kinds of faith and that faith comes in different ways and with differing intensities to different people. The beloved disciple believes upon seeing the empty tomb. Mary believes when the Lord calls her name in the garden. The disciples must see the risen Lord. Thomas says that he must touch Jesus' wounds. 
although that need seems to evaporate once he sees the risen Christ. People have differing needs and find various routes to faith. It's a reminder to each one of us that we all come through different paths and that those who follow us will also come to him by their own individual way. Verse 29 pronounces a blessing on those who will believe, though they do not see. And that we, as the readers of John's gospel, may enjoy that blessed promise. Jesus' miracles in John's writing are called signs. Signs give people reason to believe. But many who do see them still do not believe. And as always, the choice is ours. It is faith rather than works which determines our salvation. And that faith which leads and brings differs for each one of us as we come to realize that Jesus is the risen Christ. Or, sadly, if we decide he is not. My belief is, hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let us join in prayer. Lord of mercy, it has been a week since the Easter celebration. It was again a different kind of Easter in which we could celebrate, but though this world is different, you are always the same. And we thank you for the meaning of Easter. During this week, we struggle not to slump back to our old ways. The world which seems to be too much with us constantly desires to claim our joy. Our resurrection faith comes dim if we look at the world. Let the story of Thomas who wanted more than anything else to see the risen Lord pour into our hearts. 
reviving our spirits, giving assurance to our souls. Let fear within us subside. Replace our doubts with certainty in your love and healing mercies. We bring names before you this day, asking for your healing touch. And so we lift up before you these people that we know of. Andrea, Jean, Sally, Fred, Sharon, Jessica. Our family members who have children in the school system and are dealing with uh, the pandemic and closures. We pray for those people who reject the advice to wear masks and receive the vaccinations or to stay close to home. We pray for those dealing with depression in this time and for those with mental health issues due to the isolation of the pandemic. We pray for our government leaders to assess how the vaccines can efficiently be made available to all of our people in a speedy and as possible way. We pray for those who are unemployed, those that are homeless, and those who are struggling to meet financial responsibilities in these difficult times. We pray that your Holy Spirit, that your power of healing would touch each as you see fit. Be with us, Lord, as we also receive that same healing love that you offer to others. Give us joy and courage for all the times ahead. For we do offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. As we close the service today, thank you for joining us. Lord of mercy, be with us as we go from our places today. Fill our lives with your love. Help us to bring the good news of hope and peace wherever we may go. Let us truly be people of the resurrection, be Easter people every day. Amen. God bless you.